you all for being here. This is one of the SQUAB tutorials. We want to thank ABAI as well as SQUAB um, for helping put this together. So this is part of the science track as well with the panel discussion immediately following. So if you're interested in behavioral economics, please stay for the panel discussion that will be in response to Dr. Hirsch's talk. So today I have the utmost privilege and honor to introduce the icon of behavioral economics, Dr. Stephen Hirsch. He probably needs no introduction to you in this room if you're here for behavioral economics, but I will take a moment to tell you about his overall impact both within and beyond behavior analysis. He earned his BA in psychology from Wake Forest University and PhD in experimental psychology right here from the University of California, San Diego. From 1972 to 1995, Dr. Hirsch worked in the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research, ultimately serving as director for the Division of Neuropsychiatry. He also served as a senior research psychologist for the Army and consultant to the Army Surgeon General for research in behavioral sciences. Upon retiring as an Army Colonel in 1995, Dr. Hirsch has devoted his time to translating behavioral science to address policy issues that affect us all, the impetus for today's talk. For example, his work in fatigue safety has influenced policies for workers in the Federal Railroad Administration and the Federal Aviation Administration. So we can thank Dr. Hirsch for ensuring our safety when we travel. His model of fatigue is now used by all major U.S. airlines and over 30 airlines around the world, including four national air forces. Since 1995, Dr. Wirt Hirsch has worked at the Institute for Behavior Resources, where he currently serves as president. Throughout his career, he has refined the field's understanding of how organisms desire reinforcers, which spawn the field of behavioral economics. A recent paper in the Journal of Economic Surveys, which just came out, this is a major journal in economics, reviewed over 2,600 articles to identify major influences in the field. And they concluded the following, quote, the results prove the relevance of the works of Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky for the field of behavioral economics and finance, and Stephen Hirsch for behavioral economics. Thus, he truly is the father of behavioral economics, and for us, that means it's more than just our offering of behavioral economics. So I would like to welcome Dr. Hirsch today. He will discuss his conceptualization of demand and behavioral economics and how these can be leveraged to provide unique insights to guide the development of public policy. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Hirsch. Thank you, Derek, for that, that kind uh, introduction. And it's always a pleasure to, to, uh, to speak to this audience. Um, you're all, I regard you all as my friends, and it's always good to speak with friends. Um, I always get nervous before a talk. Um, when I was younger, I was nervous because I was afraid that when I was over, everybody would think I was stupid. <laughs> I'm a little bit older now. I'm going to be turning 72 next month. And uh, now I worry that when I'm done, you'll all think I'm senile. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully I will, I will uh, do better than that. But speaking of age, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard for me to grasp that it's been 40 years since I published my first paper that used economic terminology, it was in 1978, and 38 years since I published a paper that described how to use economic terminology to understand behavior, uh, and that was in uh, JAC. Uh, and I'm grateful to Tony Nevin for allowing the paper to be published because it didn't it, it broke all the molds and, and didn't really conform to the editorial policy of the journal, but he let it go, and I'm eternally <coughs> grateful to him for that. So let me give you a brief review, but I'm not going to review 40 years or 38 years of this. That would uh, take uh, perhaps the rest of the evening, and I know you used to all want to get to dinner. So I'm going to be giving you a very brief taste of the, the first, uh, say, 25 years, and really start with uh, what's happened since 2008 when uh, Alan Silverberg and I published a paper on essential value um, and using uh, a quantitative analysis based on uh, exponential, uh, an exponential model of demand. And I'm going to try to bring you up to date on my thinking since that 2008 paper 
and a little glimpse of the future. You know, where are we headed with all of this, or where can we head with all of this? And think of it as a, uh, a roadmap or a, um, a, a description of a destination that all of you are going to travel. It really is up to you to do the work, to apply all of this, and use it to influence public policy. I'm not going to be able to do that. I can maybe help give you some thought, thoughts about it, some theories about it, but it'll be up to you to turn it into practice and make a difference. I'll be talking a bit about three domains, and the public health, finance, taxation, and subsidies, transportation, environmental, and energy. I will only touch very briefly on these. I don't have enough time to go into depth, but I'm going to give you some ideas about how behavioral economics could influence and has influenced these three spheres of public policy. And, and behavioral economics helps us to understand what do people really, what do they really want and what do they want the most? Because if we don't understand what people really want, and we don't understand what influences their desires, we'll never be able to have a policy that changes what people do. Uh, and so I'll give you an introduction to exponential demand and essential value as a way to quantitatively, this is perhaps for all the quantitative meaning, a quantitative way of thinking about that. I'll talk a little bit about how that can be applied in the field of a drug addiction, and this is we could impact FA, uh, FDA policy. Talk a bit about public health, uh, health promotion, and how we might moderate on healthy behavior. Talk about finance and taxation, and how uh, you know we can understand the influence of commodity cost on hypothetical purchase tasks, and and how we can shift P max, the point of maximum uh, uh, responding for different. Uh, commodities based on changes in tax policy. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about transportation policy, and that will give me an opportunity to introduce the idea of time cost as a uh, way of thinking about a lot of policies, because policies not only affect our money cost, but they also affect our time cost. Transportation is a, is a beautiful example of how time cost can be a major factor. And then I'll, if I have the time at the end, I'm going to talk about a very technical piece. Uh, only some of you will really understand the impact of this, but I'm going to talk about what it means to have consumption less than one. That's fractional consumption. Um, and uh, those of you that have done HPT experiments know that that's, uh, that's an issue. Uh, and uh, I'll try to uh, illuminate my thinking about that. So, uh, many of you have seen this graph a hundred times, if not a thousand times, uh, because it describes basically what a demand curve is. And so we have price along the x-axis, we have consumption along the y, and we plot the changes in relative consumption with relative increases in price, and the, the curve slope uh, have a general change in slope. Uh, those things that have uh, relatively slow changes in price with in, uh, in, uh, slow changes in consumption with increases in price have low elasticity and are we might think of those as as luxury as necessities or lux, uh, uh, necessities or highly valued commodities and those commodities which uh, are highly price sensitive where we would give up consumption with relatively small increases in price are luxury goods and we can find the point of unit elasticity along these functions, which we call P max, because that's the point of maximum responding or maximum revenue. And obviously, P max for a highly elastic commodity is much lower than P max for a highly desired uh, commodity. So, basic terms Q is the quantity consumed, as, re uh, as recorded during a, a session of. Uh, or if you're asking it in a hypothetical environment, how much a person would purchase of something at a different at each price. Uh, the term C is just used as a general uh, representation of the cost of a commodity. In many animal experiments, it's the fixed ratio schedule. In human experiments, it might be the money cost. And later, I'll be talking about uh, C as a time cost. Uh, Q0 is the hypothetical y-intercept 
what is the consumption at a hypothetical zero price? And I'll talk about the significance of Q0 in a bit. Uh, if you multiply Q0 times C, that is the real price. Uh, that is the level of responding required to defend your baseline level of consumption at each FR. So uh, this is kind of esoteric, but that's an important uh, commodity to understand because that's really what it costs to get something. It's how much does it take to defend uh, your uh, baseline level of consumption. The equation that we published in 2008, uh, this is the exponential uh, equation. Q0 is the uh, origin of that function, but notice that Q0 is also in the exponent. Q0 varies with the scalar value of the reinforcer. That is, if you're looking at the size of the reinforcer, for example, one food pellet versus two food pellets, or it could be the dose and potency of a drug. Uh, and this Q0 uh, varies with the scalar value. You have higher Q0s for smaller uh, commodities. In other words, a rat will chew, will eat more reinforcers that are one pellet than, than the rat will eat of a reinforcer that's two pellets. And so Q0 is a way to capture the scalar value of that commodity. Alpha is the rate constant of the exponential. And it changes with the value of the commodity. And since Q0 times C is in the exponent also, that automatically controls for the scalar size of the reinforcer. So you don't have to worry about normalizing your data. The equation does that for you. There is also a, a, a pesky little term in this equation, k, which is the uh, a scalar constant that's used to uh, adjust for uh, the different commodities are consumed on different scales. Uh, you may consume thousands of something when it's free, or you may only consume 10 of something when it's free. So we had to have a way to scale this exponential so it could match the range that the commodity's consumption would span. And in fact, the K constant was added to this formulation at one of these meetings. You can thank your colleagues for that. If you don't like having K in there, it's because Stephen Lee said that you needed to have a way to generalize this uh, and so we get it, and I think I thank him for that because the, the formulation would have been uh, much too narrow if we didn't have a scalar constant. But there are some problems with it, uh, uh, not conceptually, but just from a methodological perspective that I'll talk about. This equation has been highly cited, and it's uh, it's on it's like an FI scallop. This is a cumulative record of of references to uh, this equation and it's on an upward swing. Um, and I guess when the reinforcer finally occurs, that'll be the end of Steve Hirsch. <laughs> uh, so uh, that's, uh, that's just shows that this has got a lot of generator. And people have, are, have been finding it very useful in describing uh, demand curves across species and across commodities. Um, and it really works. So this is an example of uh, responding for alfentanil by monkeys in a laboratory where they're actually infusing uh, alfentanil. This is a study that was done in uh, Gail Winger and Jim Woods' lab. And uh, you can see the different scalar uh, Q0s uh, for the different doses. So well, this is the lowest dose, and this would be the highest dose. And these all look like they would have different slopes. But it turns out when you fit the equation, the rate constant is absolutely constant because the Q0 term in the exponent of the, of the exponential takes care of the differences in, in the origin. And so the rate constant for this is uh, 1.4 times 10 to the minus 5. So uh, that term helps you to characterize the value of that reinforcer independent of the dose that you're using. That's really important because we're trying to understand how valuable something is, not how valuable it is in a certain package size. That's really not, that's trivially important because things can be packaged differently. So this really gets at that uh, a fundamental value which we call essential value. Okay. 
So uh, the range of, across the range of doses, there's a single rate. And uh, so this shows uh, with these two uh, drugs that, um, that alfentanil uh, uh, is much lower, has a much lower uh, sensitivity to price uh, than methotrexacol. Uh, and so therefore, it has a much lower sensitivity to price, and we would say it has a higher essential value. So essential value is really inversely proportional to alpha. So, uh, now, how do we actually define quantitatively what we mean by essential value? Uh, as I said, it is, roughly speaking, inversely proportional to alpha, but alpha also varies with k, turns out. Mathematically, if you change the k, you'll find that the alpha that you need to fit the data will also change. So, it's, uh, you have to control for k. And then, Originally, we simply said, well, keep K constant across your conditions, and there's no problem. You can then use alpha. But that could be troublesome when you're trying to compare across laboratories or across papers where K was not kept constant. Um, so um, we developed a formulation for EV that controls for the value of K. So all those folks who've struggled with this think we've got a solution that takes care of the value of K and allows you to compare across conditions of an experiment. It turns out that when you look, I took nine data sets of drug, drug self-administration work and found that there is, um, and fit them with exponential decay function, and found that there is a very nice power function that describes the relationship between uh, K and alpha. And since this is a nice, convenient relationship, you can now use that to control for K when you're trying to determine what central value is. And I'm not going to trouble you with all the mathematics here. I'll understand that if you have a power function, now you can do some algebra and you have a value term that is really constant with, uh, with the uh, alpha times K to the, to the raised to the power of 1.5, approximately. And this is, just a, this is just showing you that that's true. These are the nine uh, data sets uh, where we uh, artificially uh, change K, fit the, fit the data with different level, different K values, and found the alpha that was required to fit those data points. And you can see that they all conform to a very nice power function. And the exponent of, ex the exponent of that function is about 1.5. Um, on average. So that means that we can then do some algebra, come up with a, a, a term, a V term, which is, which is essentially what we mean by essential value. So we do a little more algebra because we want this to be normalized so it's general across different uh, Q, Q zeros. And so what we end up with is EV is 1 over alpha times K to the 1.5 times 100 because we are normalizing this to, uh, to essentially 100%, that's 100% of the, whatever the commodity is. Uh, and so turns, this is just a demonstration that for these nine drugs now, uh, if you vary the K and you've got the EV values, that those lines don't cross, generally speaking. So it didn't really matter what K we used, if we wanted to rank order these drugs, you could rank order them at virtually any value of K and you'd come up with the same rank order. Now, if you rank order them by the best fit K, which is the solid dot, then you will get a rank ordering that's, uh, that is basically independent of, of the K that you use. The one exception may be here, where these two drugs are so similar that uh, they, they, they cross, but they're almost in, indistinguishable in terms of uh, central value. Uh, this one crosses slightly here, uh, but generally speaking, uh, EV is uh, generally speaking independent of the K. So once you compute this number, it takes care of variations in K for you. All right, then we realize, it turns out, we realize that Pmax uh, Pmax, if you have ever worked with exponential demand, know that there's no algebraic way to solve for Pmax. Uh, you have to use either a, a, 
an iterative solver or some approximation equation, it turns out that, um, that uh, you can uh, do a little bit of algebra and come up with an approximation of P max based on essential value by replacing the 100 in the, in the formula with Q0. And you get this uh, function, which is a very nice linear relationship between uh, P max and EV. There's a slope difference from what it would be for an absolute exact match. Uh, and so we can correct for that. And when we correct for that difference in slope, we have now a deterministic formula for P max that allows you to just take the parameter estimates that you have from your, from your analysis, fitting the ex exponential, and then you can just use this to compute P max. And it's pretty darn accurate across a range of k's from around 1 to 6 or so. So uh, this solves another pesky problem of how to figure out what P max is. Um, and it, uh, and it, but it all makes sense because it's all related We've always, we've constant, we've traditionally used P max as a kind of measure of value, but it wasn't really that good because it also varies with Q zero. Um, but it was, it wasn't too surprising that EV would would have a connection with P max, and it does. And this is this is the you know, this is the relationship, and it does work. Uh, this is that same uh, alfentanyl uh, work showing you that the P max values that you derive with that equation do, do match the peak uh, of the function, the point of maximum, point of maximum response. So now let's just, I was supposed to be about public policy and I've just given you a tutorial on the mathematics of demand curves, but uh, you needed that uh, to understand what I'm gonna say next. So, um, so now let's, let's think about uh, um, uh, the issue of, of, of drug consumption. And how does the FDA go about figuring out which drugs are going to have to be Schedule II, Schedule One? How, how, how to control, and when a new drug is developed, how do we decide uh, how, that, how much we should regulate that, that commodity? And it turns out that you can get uh, the, uh, if you look at the EVs for these three drugs, ketamine, PCP, and disulfosamine, which are all NMD antagonists, but they vary in their uh, reinforcing value, if you will, their EV. And so we have the highest EV here and the lowest here. And that also relates to the time to onset of peak action of the drug. When you plot that, you find that essential value is inversely related to the time it takes for the drug to have its peak action. In other words, how quickly it hits your brain and has an effect. And that's no surprise to any of you who are behavior analysts, no delay of reinforcement is a critically important factor. But this proves that it is one of the factors that is implied or uh, in, involved in why certain drugs are highly abused. And you can use this then to rank order drugs in terms of essential value. Um, and so here are uh, just rank orders uh, of drugs based on various experiments that, uh, that uh, have been done over the years, uh, mostly by Gail Winger and Jim Woods. Uh, it's just a demonstration that it can be used to rank order uh, drugs and could have value uh, for drug control policy. So, uh, the other thing that we need to understand is that commodities are not consumed in a vacuum. They're always consumed in the context of other commodities. And so they always interact with one another. Um, and so how do we generalize this to an understanding of, of commodity interactions? Or put another way, choice. Uh, and econ economists talk about substitutes and complements in a rather general term, a general way, that uh, some things substitute for one another, some things complement one another. And so what we have come up with is essentially uh, and a derivation uh, or an extension of the exponential demand curve to, to also describe these drug interactions or these commodity interactions. So this is own price demand, which I've already told you about. Now, if you have another commodity in the same environment that's 
with a fixed price, its consumption might vary as a result of changes in the price of the other commodity because it might be consumed in substitution for that commodity. So as you raise the price of, of commodity A and consumption goes down, consumption of commodity B may go up, even though its price is fixed, it may go up as a substitute. And this is an equation that captures that relationship. And the I term determines whether it's a, a substitute or a complement. If the I term is negative, then the commodity is a substitute because it's one commodity's uh, consumption subtracts from the other, roughly speaking. Uh, if the I constant term is positive, then they're complements. In other words, consumption of one goes down, the complement would go down, like uh, uh, automobiles and tires are complements. You can't have one, you don't need, you don't need tires if you don't have a car. Uh, so those two would be complements. And so let's look and see. Uh, these have been experiments that have been done in the past to show the value uh, how uh, I varies with different uh, experiments. And uh, this is an experiment with uh, methadone. Uh, the price of methadone is being varied along the x axis, and these are two different demand curves for methadone. This was the demand curve for methadone when there was no alternative present. And this is the demand curve when hypermorphone was available as a substitute. This is the increase in hypermorphone's consumption as the price of, of uh, methadone went up. So this is uh, captured by that cross price elasticity function I just showed you. But also notice that the demand curve or the elasticity of consumption of methadone is sensitive to whether or not hypermorphone is present. And so the uh, the alpha term in the home price equation for um, methadone captures the impact of having an alternative commodity available in the same situation. So the essential value, think of it this way, the essential value of methadone is reduced when there's something else, another opiate available. It's no longer <coughs> as essential. Now, uh, you can use that you can then do an experiment looking at two commodities that turn out to be complements to one another. It turns out that ethanol uh, is a, is a complement to cigarette smoking and vice versa. So if we vary the price of a, of a cigarette um, and you show a decrease in consumption of, uh, of uh, cigarette puffs, there will also be a decrease in alcohol consumption as a consequence. And notice that there is also a shift in the demand curve for cigarettes depending on whether ethanol is present in the environment or not. And so uh, there is a cross-price um, impact. All right. And so the I constant here is minus 3, and the I constant here is plus 0.46. Now, this in more recent work, uh, and this is work that's uh, recently been done by uh, Mark Lesage and his colleagues, uh, looking at, uh, this is in rodents, looking at uh, some very important tobacco related work, looking at how electronic cigarettes might impact uh, demand for cigarettes, uh, for nicotine. Uh, and uh, in this case, we have, or they're changing the price of nicotine and looking at uh, increases in the consumption of uh, an electronic cigarette equivalent uh, and showing that the, the, it is a substitute but also showing that the demand for nicotine is sensitive to the presence of the alternative as a substitute. And the, the flip side is also true. If you vary the price of the electronic cigarette equivalent, you will see an increase in consumption, which is at a fixed price, of the nicotine alternative. And the presence of the nicotine alternative uh, changes the elasticity or the demand for uh, the uh, the presence of the nicotine affects the demand for the electronic cigarette book. So the point of all of this, and, and, and Mark is, is the expert on this, is that this is a way to now provide some guidance to public policy on electronic cigarettes. How much do they affect uh, or potentially could affect uh, demand for uh, nicotine in cigarettes, presumably? 
assuming, of course, that electronic cigarettes are a lot more healthy, and there's some question about that. But were they more healthy to individuals? This just gives us a way to figure out uh, how much they would interact, what price would you have to have for an electronic cigarette to successfully compete with nicotine and so forth. So this is just foundational work that helps in tobacco regulation uh, policy. Uh, that was work done with rodents where you can actually give them access to these drugs, which is very convenient with animals, but uh, doing actual uh, uh, drug uh, administration with people is often not very feasible or ethical, and so what has been used is hypothetical purchase tasks, and I'm not the expert on this, the experts are sitting out here in the audience, I'm going to be uh, using a lot of their papers to illustrate this. Um, hypothetical purchase task involves asking people how much of something would they purchase um, at different level, different prices. Hypothetically, they're usually given a, some sort of a budget and they're told uh, how much would you buy, you can't save it, you can't give it away, you can't sell it, how much would you buy just for your own use. And um, uh, or in more recent work, we we found that you can also ask them what's your probability of purchasing it at that price. Sometimes that's a more reasonable thing to ask than how many of them would you purchase. It's kind of hard to ask a person, how many refrigerators would you buy at different prices? <laughs> we only need one of those, right? So, uh, so you can ask though, what's the probability that you buy a new refrigerator at different prices? Uh, it's well, just all those HPTs, and I, there may be exceptions, but most of the ones I've seen are well described by exponential demand. And uh, they uh, can you you can use those to determine the, uh, uh, the essential value and elasticity of demand for different commodities, and you can use this this very easily across, across a broad range of commodities and rapidly get estimates of essential value for different commodities under different hypothetical circumstances, uh, and you can use those to then calculate what would be the hypothetical, what would be the Pmax under these hypothetical conditions. And there have been studies to validate that those hypothetical values are pretty realistic for what people would actually do. And this becomes a guide for public policy. Uh, so here is an experiment that, uh, that I uh, credit to uh, Murphy and McKillop. It's a sort of a foundational piece of work that demonstrates the value of HPT for looking at a commodity uh, like uh, cigarettes, uh, I mean in this case uh, alcohol, um, and they're looking at how many drinks would they purchase at different prices, and what you find is that for the heavy drinkers, you have a higher Q0 and a lower elasticity uh, as compared to the light drinkers. So the heavy drinkers are about half as price sensitive as uh, the light drinkers. So the exponential function captures the, 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 uh, the, the data very nicely and the exponent of the function captures the differences between these two groups. Uh, so it seems to work and of course the Pmax is also uh, are reasonably uh, related to whether they're heavy drinkers or light drinkers, with the, with the light drinkers having a lower Pmax. Now, in a more recent work that's been done uh, with uh, Pete Roma and Derek Reed and, uh, and, and Florence and myself, we were using an internet-based uh, uh, system for collecting hypothetical demand across a range of commodities. Uh, Burgers or preferred sandwich, toilet paper, refrigerators, pay-for-view movies, fine dining, and a vacation package. Now the point of this was not so much, I mean none of you really care what, what the Pmax for those different commodities are, right? That's, that's, that really wasn't the point of all of this. The point of this was to demonstrate that it, that it works and that you can get reasonable exponential demand functions in this, using this methodology. We varied the, the price density and found the price density in this case had no impact on the fitted function. It really didn't matter that much within the range that we tested. Uh, and, it, and it also demonstrated that probability, uh, here's a case where we had refrigerators. We had to ask probability, not numbers of consumption. Probability was very nicely fit to by the exponential demand just as well as uh, quantity consumed. 
so it gives you a, a general way of looking at commodities. So, uh, so what's the what's the practical significance of this? That was that was a good methodological demonstration, but now how can we put this into practice uh, in some meaningful meaningful way? So. We are going to want to talk about some relatively new work that's been done uh, at IBR by Lindsay Schwartz, uh, recently uh, obtained her uh, PhD uh, from American University doing her work at IBR, looking at HPT across a variety of commodities with our patients. We have a 600 patient methadone clinic at IBR. Uh, we have individuals who are recently have recently used opiates, and we have others who have been uh, opiate-free for very long periods of time. So the question was, let's look at hypothetical demand across drugs for these two, two different populations and see if we get reasonable differences. And what we found uh, was, first of all, that the functions are all very nicely. We're looking at average consumption at different prices in these two groups. So this is average data, uh, but you get good functions uh, with individuals. Um, you get very nice exponential demand curves, and we get a nice difference between, this is the patients who are, have just recently joined our clinic and they have recently been using um, opiates, and these are the uh, demand curves for uh, patients who have been abstinent for at least 18 months. They haven't had any positive indication of using an opiate for, other than methadone, so that we have a methadone clinic. Uh, and you can see very nice differentiation between these two groups, early and late in treatment. And so we summarize the uh, essential values. We find that, that there are significant differences in essential value of heroin, good, we, that's what they were in treatment for, right? So we have very low, uh, a very big change in the essential value of heroin, a very big change in uh, uh, the essential value of opiate pills, because many of our patients were using pills, not heroin. Uh, interestingly, although they're not directly treated for cocaine addiction, they also show a significant reduction in hypothetical demand for cocaine, cigarettes, and alcohol. And you might ask, alcohol, that seems odd. Well, it turns out that our methadone patients are told not to drink alcohol if you're taking methadone. Those two don't go together well. And the ones who were in treatment for a long time show that in their hypothetical demand, they are compliant with that, with that uh, recommendation. Now, there are two cases where there is no difference. Methadone, that's what they're being treated with. So they both desire and have a high essential value for methadone. That's the treatment drug, and they, there's no difference between the two groups. And the control commodity, our famous toilet paper example. Uh, there's no difference in, but you know, it's a trivial thing, but, but we have to have a commodity which shows that, that it's not just a, um, a difference between the groups and they would change, they would be different on anything we asked them. So we wanted to show that it is commodity specific and it is commodity specific. Toilet paper happens to be a very nice commodity because we buy lots of it. And, uh, and it's pretty essential, right? At least I wouldn't like to have, live with that. So, uh, so, so that's working. Now this is really just foundational work. What we'd like to do is demonstrate that this can be used to track a patient through therapy. This is a way to see how the progress of an individual as they go through longitudinally through treatment. We've demonstrated that the te technology is sensitive to that, but can we now show that it will track a person through treatment and show how they're making progress in their treatment and potentially use it to target that treatment to specific commodities which continue to be highly demanded. That, uh, that needs specific targeted uh, therapy. So this is just foundational for what will be an agenda, a research agenda, to, uh, to demonstrate that this is a, a clinically useful tool. Um, now let's change gears a little bit, talk a little bit about finance and taxation. And I have to credit uh, my, my good friend, uh, Derek and Brent, um, 
uh, University of Kansas and, uh, and Pete Roma at IBR. Uh, this is an experiment looking at um, hypothetical demand for tanning salon uh, visits uh, by three different groups. Uh, the, uh, the top uh, function is for individuals who have, who have recently used tanning salons. The middle function is for individuals who have used it in the past but not recently. And then the bottom function is uh, for uh, individuals who have never used a tanning salon. And what they're looking at is the impact of an excise tax on tanning. Now this is, this is something that's actually been thought about as a public policy um, initiative. And what they found was that the individuals who have never used it or have not used it recently are the most sensitive to the excise tax and those individuals who are using it frequently are the least sensitive to the excise tax. So what does that tell us from a public policy perspective? It's not a great way, possibly, not, not a great way to, uh, to terminate a person's addiction, but it might be a great way to discourage somebody from becoming addicted. Uh, to a uh, tanning. Uh, not a bad thing, not a bad thing at all from a public policy perspective, but it's a good warning that um, it is going to be specific to individuals and may not be generally have the same effect on everybody. And then I credit them for really discovering what I think is an important uh, policy consideration. Um, time is also an important a factor in our decision making. Uh, queuing for services, how long do you have to wait for that service? Uh, how uh, our choice of transportation, we usually choose a mode of transportation based on how long it's going to how long it's going to take us to get there. Trains are much less popular now because people just don't want to spend a lot of time going from a, a point A to point B. They'd much rather fly. So time is an important cost factor. It makes a lot of it has a lot of impact on our choices. Uh, public transportation, the time between trains uh, is a, an important policy issue. Uh, choices between fuel alternatives. Uh, if you have to go a long way to get a, uh, a more uh, environmentally friendly fuel, you may be much less inclined to choose that alternative than if it's freely and readily available close to your home. And, uh, and now in, the, uh, in this era of electric cars, we can see that uh, a great deal of emphasis is being put on the time cost associated with electric vehicles. Uh, how long do you have to go between recharges? And the longer that vehicle can go between recharges, the more popular it's going to be. And the time it takes to recharge it, uh, there be, there's a lot of attention being put to making it possible to recharge a vehicle within 20 or 30 minutes rather than overnight, which would discourage you from so again, there's a real sensitivity to time cost in the commercial sector, and we have now, uh, now can we use uh, this understanding of time cost in our experiments? So, uh, we've just begun to do this kind of work where we're looking at time cost using HPT. Uh, this is an experiment with college students looking at uh, money cost for different commodities, and we get, as uh, we always, whoops, as we always get, we get these nice exponential demand curves. Over here, we have the same commodities, but now we're asking them, okay, you can get it at a discount price immediately, or you can get it at that discount price, but you've got to wait for delivery for two days, four days, a week, two weeks, a month. And we look at the probability that they would purchase it, given those time delays that they would have to accept in order to get the commodity. And well, lo and behold, we find that generally speaking, those functions are well fit by the exponential demand function as well. Now, I don't want to over uh, sell the comparability of money cost and time cost, because I don't believe that the same, a commodity would necessarily have the same elasticities for money cost and time cost. An example would be heroin. A person who's addicted to heroin may have a very low elasticity for money cost, but a very high elasticity for time cost. Because getting heroin two days from now is not going to do me any good today. Right? So, so a commodity doesn't necessarily have, uh, 
when you look at cost quantities, time cost uh, elasticities and money cost elasticities may not be rank ordered in the same way. But this is very early. We are going to be doing the same experiment with our methadone patients to see what we get from that. That should be the, the next interesting chapter in the story. Now, uh, but this is, you can think of this in terms of transportation policy. And this is, a, this is data from Europe looking at mode choice for um, railroad transportation. We took the same data and we now take a hypothetical trip from San Francisco to Los Angeles and looked at the uh, choice, the probability of choice of that mode of transportation for different uh, uh, trip durations. And we find that if it goes 45 miles an hour, you'd only have about a 5% market share. If it goes 80 miles an hour, you get about a 30% market share. If it goes uh, 100 miles an hour, you get about a 50% market share. And if it goes 140 miles an hour, you would get a 70% market share. So assuming that the train is more environmentally friendly than the alternatives, this shows that the faster the train goes, the more likely you will have people switching to that mode of transportation. That isn't too surprising, but we now have the technology to figure out exactly what that function should look like. This was in Europe, we don't know what it is for the United States, but we now have hypothetical purchase tasks using time as the cost. We could figure out what is the time elasticity of modes of transportation in the United States if we chose to do that. So, let's talk now about something that may be a little controversial about delayed discounting, because most of you have probably thought about time cost in terms of delayed discounting. And the delayed discounting, uh, what, a, what delayed discounting means in a nutshell is that the, the value of a commodity diminishes for the longer I have to wait for it. And so um, now I want you to think about, turn this around a little bit. Delayed discounting experiments are usually framed as a choice between something now uh, uh, or something later. And when, uh, what, and then we vary the uh, time cost of, of a large commodity, and we look to see what a smaller immediate reinforcer would be cho chosen uh, at different uh, time costs for the target commodity. And we get indifference functions, or different indifference points. Well, let's think about that. It's a choice experiment. I just gave you two equations for conceptualizing the interaction between two commodities. So here is own price elasticity, this is cross price uh, function, and how we can take these two and do a little algebra and combine them and come up with a model for how these two commodities would interact in a matrix. So we're, we, uh, I've, I've simplified this and normalized it to a, um, a, a quantity 100% a scale, it's just easier to do the simulation with a 100 point scale. Um, uh, and so uh, we now have a, a, a commodity. Uh, the, we have a, a, a commodity that has A has a fixed uh, size, and we have commodity B that has a variable size. We're going to vary the time it takes to get commodity A, and we're going to see at what point does it cross the demand curve for B that has a uh, that, that has um, uh, that is immediate but is of smaller size. And what we get is a family of demand curves. Now this is very familiar to, this is just like those demand curves that I showed you earlier with nicotine and, and electronic cigarettes, for example. But now this is all in simulation. This is, this is the demand curve for the target commodity showing its, the less, its effects, uh, changes in consumption with the time cost. And we have different, this is the alternative that's being chosen as a substitute. And these curves cross. And those, where they cross, are the indifference points. Those are exactly the kind of indifference points you get in the delayed discounting experiment. But we've done it by not modeling it as two interacting demand curves. What if we now take these indifference points and plot them the way we would if it was a delayed discounting experiment? This is time of cost here, and this is the amount of the commodity that has to be given as an alternative to get an equivalent level of choice. And lo and behold, 
this interacting set of demand, demand curves gives you hyperbolic discounting. And it does not fit exponential discounting, which was uh, the original thought that economists had that it would be exponential. So you can model delayed discounting as the interaction of demand curves for two alternatives. But why is this an advantage? Well, because we now can conceptualize this as interacting commodities that are not necessarily directly substitutable. First of all, let's vary the time elasticity of commodity A. And if you vary time elasticity, you'll find that the more time elastic the commodity is, the higher the discount rate, which is what you'd expect. If time is going to be highly effective in diminishing your consumption, then you should have a higher discount rate. And, the, and the, actually it works out that way in the simulation. Now, let's look at the interaction term. That's something you generally can't do in a, in a delay discounting experiment. Vary how substitutable the context is for the commodity that's being delayed. But in the simulation, we can vary that and see how that would impact. And you would expect that as, as the context is more is more as the target commodity is more influenced by the context, you would expect it to be more sensitive to delays. And that's what you get. That the higher uh, the interaction term, the more it's affected by the context, the greater the rate constant of the delay discount function. And this just shows you what that relationship is. So we can now conceptualize delayed discounting as an interaction between demand curves, and now we can think of it, and we break out of the mold of always thinking of this in terms of uh, two identical reinforcers. They may not be identical. It may be the choice that we're making is between uh, money now or money later and a house now or something. It, it, these kinds of decisions don't always involve equivalent come up, uh, the same commodity. Now, what if we conceptualize this as a question about your delay, your your value of a commodity, and it's not affected at all by the context. It has no interaction with the context. And that's what you get here. You still get hyperbolic discounting, but it turns out that in that situation, exponential discounting is a very good, perhaps even a better description of the effect. So if you think about it, economists, when they first thought about money cost, uh, the time cost of money may have been thinking about it without considering the context. It was context independent. And if it's context independent, it really would be exponential. And But when you think of it as a choice, as we did and as we have done with delayed discounting, it's hyper a lot. Now, uh, in the last of the few work minutes that I have, and I only have a few minutes, I'm going to talk a little about consumption less than one. If you're doing hypothetical demand curves, there's got to be a point at which somebody says, no, I won't buy one at that price. Does that mean they have zero demand? It means that they're not willing to buy one, but they may willing, be willing to buy half of it at that unit price. But that's generally not asked. Uh, and so the question is, is uh, what happens uh, at uh, demand that's less than one? Well, it turns out if you average across people, you will often find that there is there is levels of consumption less than one when you average across people. Some are zeros, others are, are more than zero. When you average, you get some, some fractional amount of consumption. And the demand curve, the exponential demand curve will level off as you get to higher and higher prices. So it, it's level, it descends, and then it levels off again. It's an S-shaped function. And it turns out that that's what the demand, that's what the exponential does, and that's what the data do. It really is an S-shaped function. And what that predicts is that at the highest levels of price, you actually get an increase in revenue. An odd, perhaps counterintuitive phenomenon, but it actually is borne out uh, when you actually ask people that they would actually, it turns out, would actually, if you were to aggregate the revenue, you would actually get an increase in revenue at those very high prices because their consumption is not going out down at the same rate that the price is going up. And uh, 
and uh, Derek and uh, and his colleagues uh, Gideon and Brett uh, just shared some data with me where they have done something where they're not averaging in zeros now. They're just asking them at their first zero, all right, would you take a little, take less of it at the same unit price? And so if it was a one gram commodity, they say, well, would you buy half a gram? It's the same unit price, but would you buy half a gram or a quarter of a gram? And then they find out what their fractional consumption would be. And that's often what we have, what we can do. You can buy less of it, right? And what they got was this nice S-shaped function, and they actually showed in their experiment the increase in revenue that the model predicts without averaging in zeros to get it. Am I am I correct? Um, so it's not a it's not an artifact of averaging. Whole industries are based on this phenomenon of increased revenue at very high prices where fractional demand is present. And here they are. All of these are things where we don't buy the whole thing. We just rent for a certain amount of time. A limousine, net jets, they have there are fractional aviation here. They will they will rent you a plane for one trip. You don't have to own the plane. Uh, discount rental centers, you, you, you're if you need a cement mixer, you're not going to go out and buy a cement mixer. You'll just rent it for a day. That's fractional consumption. It's less than one. If you're getting, you know, you don't really own it, you just have it for a certain amount of time. All these industries are based on that increase in revenue that occurs at fractional levels of consumption. Uh, and that's all predicted by the exponential um, demand curve. So, Demand less than one is not equal to, consumption less than one is not equal to zero demand, and these industries prove that. Any questions? Yeah. I use all my time, you can see me in the hallway. <laughs>